we have a wonderful program coming up. I'm David Eisenberg. I'm very pleased to, to welcome you to this Mathematical Horizons 1. Two wonderful speakers, and I'm looking forward to their talk. First is Suraf Chatterjee. He was a student of Percy Diaconus at Stanford. Then I'm happy to say he came to Berkeley. Unfortunately, he left Berkeley again after a while and went to New York and then came back to Stanford. But at least he's our near neighbor and a frequent collaborator and visitor here. He won the Rollo Davidson Prize in 2010 and most recently the Levé Prize in Probability in uh, 2013. And I'm looking forward to his talk on nonlinear large deviations. Suraf. Thank you for the gracious introduction and uh, thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, so, so this is uh, uh, something that I have been working on um, for the last uh, few years. Uh, so uh, I was asked to prepare the talk uh, at the level of incoming graduate students, so that's what I did. Uh, I don't see that many incoming graduate students here. Uh, so uh, to all the senior people, you know, uh, please don't feel insulted if it's too easy, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to. Well, we know just as little as they do. <laughs> okay, okay so, um, uh, so let me start by saying a few things about the area of large deviations. Um, you know, it's a technical part of uh, probability theory. Uh, and there are two main goals of large deviations theory. One is to study the probabilities of rare events. So uh, events that are very rare, the probabilities are very tiny, but you want, want to understand how tiny it is. And you want to understand the conditional distributions uh, given that some rare event has, has occurred. So, so the thing is, the world doesn't look the same if something um, unlikely has happened, so things change. So you want to understand how things change if, given that something unlikely has happened. So, you know, a silly example here. Uh, so, like, what is the chance it will win the lottery? And the second thing is, how is your life going to change if you win the lottery? So that's uh, the conditional distribution part. So often the second question is more interesting than the first. Because the first is just a number. It's some small number, it's a number. The second question is more uh, complicated. Uh, you know, you don't know how things are going to be affected if something very unlikely happens. Um, but it's usually essential to answer the first question before uh, you want to, uh, you know, you, uh, you can understand the second. So you want to, you, you have to know the probability of the event before understanding. Uh, and there, there are technical reasons for that, why that is necessary. So uh, a simple example, uh, uh, you, know, the, you know, the lottery example is some real life thing which is too complicated to capture by uh, mathematical models, but uh, a simple example is toss a fair coin n times where n is some large number. And under normal circumstances, this is what you'd expect. You'd, uh, you'd expect to get approximately n over two heads, okay, since it's a fair coin. And you also want to know the number of times you'd get two consecutive heads, so head and head, you know. So, uh, so roughly n over four pairs um, of these uh, you'll get um, consecutive heads. Okay, so that's uh, some simple probabilistic computation that you can do. So suppose the following rare event occurs, that instead of n over two heads, you get two n over three. Uh, okay, so if you're tossing the coin a thousand times, instead of getting 500 heads, you get 666 or more uh, heads. And there are some general purpose tools. Uh, I, I'm going to briefly describe how these computations are done. So this event, you can uh, write down the probabilities approximately, asymptotically, it's like e to the minus n times uh, some number, okay? Um, and um, moreover, you can make conclusions like the following, that if this happens, then this, uh, this thing, the number of consecutive heads, pairs of consecutive heads that you get, instead of being n over four, it will likely be four n over nine, so it will increase. So you can say this kind of conditional thing, that given this rare event has happened, you, you, get, uh, you see other uh, things also changing. Other things that were very likely before become unlikely now, and things that were unlikely before become um, uh, likely now. So, so this is a very simple uh, thing. Uh, you can do it in many ways. Uh, if you, you know, if you're familiar with Stirling's formula and all that, you can. There are uh, you know hundred different ways you can do this. But um, you know, as in math, uh, there is only one way which generalizes. Okay. So there are many ways to do this, but there is only one way which becomes abstract and generalizes to a more, more complicated settings. So the next slide will be a little bit of math. Um, and then I'll uh, you know, move, move back to this mode where I'm not showing. 
So, so just this one slide of math I have. So, so this is how you do this. So how is this estimate obtained, this, this probabilistic estimate that I wrote down? So this is how you do it. It's a little bit of an undergraduate uh, exercise. So, uh, so suppose x1 to xn are independent random variables. Each is 0 or 1 with probability half. Um, then the number of heads in n tosses uh, is the same as the sum of these random variables. And then you do this little computation here. Uh, so you want to find the chance that you get at least 2n over 3 heads. So you take some theta, you write this event as saying e to the theta sn is bigger than e to the th 2 theta n over 3. So these two are the same things. Now this is this general purpose mark of inequality that you have in probability, that probability x bigger than t is less than expected value of x over t. So you just write this down. Now, uh, the, the nice thing about this one is that it's a product of independent random variables, so it breaks up as a product of expectations, and each of them is easy to compute. This, these are just zero, one variables, so you can write this down. So you use Markov's inequality, use independence, and then you optimize this bound over theta, and you get some upper bound on this probability. Okay, so this is less than or equal to. Now, the interesting thing is that this upper bound is actually the correct uh, asymptotic, and that, uh, that requires a different idea. Now, both this technique and this other idea, which I'm not showing here, they generalize to an abstract setting, and this is a sort of the beginning idea in uh, the theory of large deviations. This is how you compute large deviation probabilities in most cases. So, so you see, there are several things here. They're independent random objects. They're summing up to give something, and then you apply this mark of inequality, and uh, the, main, the key point is that this expectation breaks up as a product, and then you optimize, and uh, you get a bound, and it's unclear why this bound should give you the right answer, but it does. And uh, so this example has this built-in linearity, which allows you to compute this expectation, and this idea generalizes. This is, there's a fast generalization of this, this simple idea and the corresponding idea for the lower bound, and this is the main um, a technique behind the theory of a classical theory of large deviation. So, so you go from the zero one random variables to more complicated objects. You go, you go to function spaces and you generalize and you you get uh, you know amazing things. Uh, so, you know, uh, literature spanning fifty years. Um, so, um, but the thing is, there are no general tools for nonlinear functionals. Okay, so there is this linearity here. Okay, but. Uh, there are no tools for nonlinear functionals. I'll, I'll give you um, an example uh, in the next slide, okay? Uh, what, what I mean by nonlinear. And uh, so, so you see, you understand how linearity helps in, in the previous slide, the, you know, in this expectation breaking up as, as a product because you get a sum of independent things, or, you know, in linear combination, would, you can do the same thing. But uh, in nonlinear, you cannot do the same trick, okay? So, uh, so here is a, a real life example, um, uh, sort of. Uh, so analysis of real world networks, so this is uh, becoming more important these days and you know, lots and lots of papers. Um, now, rare, the thing is, rare events on networks, large deviations on networks, uh, are often nonlinear in nature, okay? So consider the following simple model. Uh, there are n individuals, and any two are friends with a certain probability p and not friends with probability one minus p and friendships are all independent, okay? So this is uh, known as the Eder-Schrenny model and this is not realistic mainly because this um, assumption that friendships are independent, which is not true in reality, but uh, this is the first step to understanding real networks. Okay, okay. So, uh, so in graph theoretic terminology, an individual is called a vertex and a friendship is called, sorry. It's called an edge. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, so you, you, this, is a, this is a model of a graph and uh, you, have, uh, you have these edges in the graph. Okay. And uh, you consider um, a simple object which is the number of triangles, a number of you know, triplets of people who are all friends with each other. And there's an easy computation. You can compute that the expected value of the number of triangles in this graph, you can exactly write it down. So there's, an, you know, n choose three is the total number of tri triangles, and each of them is actually a triangle in the graph with probability p cubed and so on. So, so that's, so now the large deviation question is, what is the probability that there are k triangles where k is some number much bigger than this expected value? So what is the chance that there are many more triangles than what you'd expect? Okay, so that's a, that's a basic question that you can ask about the graph. And what does a graph look like if such a rare event happens? So if, if you observe many more triangles, 
you know, you observe, you know, three people uh, being all friends with each other many more times than you would expect just by chance. Uh, what does the graph look like? So this is an example of a nonlinear problem because the number of triangles uh, is a nonlinear function of the adjacency matrix. The adjacency matrix of the graph um, is, um, uh, you know, the, mat the matrix uh, with, uh, which, which has zeros or ones depending on whether there's an edge between i and j or not. And this is a, you know, the, the entries are all independent. And this is a nonlinear function of this entry. So this is a very simple, basic, nonlinear uh, question, that's one of the simplest you can think of. However, the strange thing is that, you know, this was open. So this was completely open. People didn't know how to do this, uh, this large division. So, so this, this thing about uh, number of heads in n coin tosses, this was a basic linear question. And, uh, you know, it, it is very old. People knew how to do this for a very long time. But this, this question, um, uh, this, you, you go one step higher. You just take a random graph with all independent edges, and you look at the number of triangles. And what is the chance that uh, you know, there are many more triangles than you expect? Or uh, what, is a, what does the graph look like if, uh, so by many more, I mean maybe two times, or you know, 1.5 times more triangles. So if it was just a little bit more, people understood that. You know, very small, infinitesimally more people understood. But if it was a fraction more, you know, there was no understanding of um, um, uh, you know, how, to, how, to approach, uh, how to even approach this question. So this was done, uh, so I, uh, you know, together with Raghu Varadhan at NYU, we, we did this in 2011. And uh, so, the, uh, so this uh, theory um, uh, brought together things from various areas. So it's a, it's a bunch of large deviation techniques, and there were, uh, you know, Samaritis regularity lemma, and then uh, there was uh, the graph limit theory developed by Lofas and Quater. So uh, various things came together, uh, which, was, um, which was pleasing. Um, so, so here is an example, the kind of results. So I'll, I'll give you, in this slide, I'll give you a very counterintuitive sort of result uh, that you get from this, um, this investigation. So recall this model. You have n individuals. Any two are friends with probability p independently, and t be the number of triangles. Let e t be the expected number of triangles. And uh, so you would want to know what is the most likely structure of the graph if this rare event happens. That, uh, the number of triangles is a fraction more than the expected value. So, so there are various possibilities. One is that all the extra triangles are contained in a small subset of vertices which are, have high connectivity among themselves. So the graph can look like that. There's a small bunch of vertices which are highly connected. There's sort of click uh, uh, of people. Uh, so that they give all the more uh, triangles. Or it can happen because there is an excess number of edges spread independently. It's just that there are many uh, more friendships than you would expect, so just uniformly distributed. So what, you know, what is it, uh, you know, what is, uh, what is the most likely scenario? So surprisingly, uh, the theory implies that both scenarios can happen. Okay, so that, is, that was a surprise to us. So more precisely, it's the following. So uh, I'll say it in words in the next slide, but just let me say it in math uh, in this slide. There exists uh, a delta 1 and delta 2, two numbers. So that if, if this delta here is between del delta 1 and 0 or bigger than delta 2, then conditional on this event, the graph just behaves like an Erdos-Schrony graph. So it just behaves as if there were an extra, num extra number of friendships or edges spread out uniformly all over. Okay? On the other hand, if delta is between delta 1 and delta 2, then the conditional structure is different. So then there is a clustering. Okay. So that, you know... So, so these, and I should say that then, you know, that there was this very nice work of Lubetsky and Zhao uh, uh, afterwards where they found these formulas for delta 1 and delta 2. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, so there's this symmetric and uh, broken symmetry regime, and they found the exact boundaries between, so they, they had a phase di diagram in the language of statistical mechanics. Okay. So, so in words, uh, what this means is the following, that... Uh, if the number of triangles exceeds the expected value by a little bit or by a lot, then the most likely scenario is that the excess number of edges spread uniformly. Okay, so you have this graph. You observe an excess number of triangles. If the excess number is a small fraction more or is a large fraction more, then you would expect the erdos schrony behavior. Uh, then you would expect that the, all the edges are spread uniformly. Whereas if, there, if it belongs to middle range, then there is a clustering of edges. Then you can say that with high probability, there is a clustering of edges 
Um, and the exact nature of this is still not fully understood. Uh, so in the sense of uh, this graph limit theory, which I you know, uh, don't have time to go into um, now, uh, but it comes as a solution of a variational problem and we cannot solve the problem, but we can show that there is a clustering. Okay, and the thing is, so this is somehow, this demonstrates the value of mathematics because these results cannot be guessed and I still don't know what's the intuition that you get this sort of uniform behavior uh, if you have a little more of, or you have a lot more, but somewhere in between you get a clustering. So, you know, I, you know we don't have any understanding of why this happens. It just comes out of, uh, of the calculations that, uh, you, know, you know, now we have tools by which to calculate things and these calculations can yield these results which, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you cannot, you know, justify by other means. Any questions till now? Yes. Can the clustering be described as a phase transition? It is a phase transition. It, it is a phase transition. So, so you know, I, I wasn't, uh, you know, wanting to go into that. So it's in a statistical mechanics language, uh, there is an order parameter, which is uh, what is called a graphon in the graph limit theory and this order parameter. Uh, uh, so there is a variational problem whose solution can either be a constant function, which is a symmetric regime, or it, it can be a non-constant function. So it's a broken symmetry, region of broken symmetry. So, so and, and there can be more than, uh, you know, so we, we identified these two phase transitions that happen, there can be more happening in between and we still don't know whether, whether it happens. Is yes. There, there can be, you know, we, we don't. In the case where there's a cluster, it doesn't say there, there aren't other. Things. No, it doesn't, it doesn't, yeah, yeah, yes. Does delta one and delta two depend on N and D or they just uh, no, uh, they depend on they depend on p, so they, do, they do, don't depend on n because it's an asymptotic result. So, so this result p is fixed, but n is going to infinity. Okay, so so they depend on p, delta one and delta two. Yeah. So uh, you know this was a very you know clever piece of work where they actually found this. You know we you know we tried very hard, uh, Raghu and I tried very hard to get this, but we we couldn't. Um, um, any example pictures? What? I mean, pictures of graphs representing the cluster. Uh, no, so the thing is, there is, a, there is a difficulty doing that because you have to, okay, so this is another value of large deviations. You have to simulate conditional or rare event. Now, the event is rare, right? So, so you know, the chances are extremely small. So you may have to wait for many years before you get something by the simulations. But the thing is, rare events do happen. You know, you know hundreds of millions of people buy the lottery and somebody wins. So, uh, okay, so. So rare events do happen. Um, okay, so then there are some other applications. Uh, there, there are these exponential random graph models which are you know, widely used in the analysis of real social networks and uh, you know, there are, we can say things about those also. Now, there is an incompleteness of this theory. Um, so uh, there's the large deviation theory for random graphs. It's, you know, it was fairly well developed in, in, the, in, uh, in our paper and subsequent papers, but has one very serious shortcoming, which is that it applies only to dense graphs. So what does it mean? So a graph is called dense if most vertices are connected to a sizable fraction of other vertices, okay? So for instance, in the Edoshani graph where n is 10,000 and p is 0.3, so there are 10,000 people and any two are connected to chance uh, 30%, then each person has approximately 3,000 other friends, okay? Which is an unrealistic uh, scenario. So, so if you have 10,000 people in a real social network, you know, even if the Erdos-Cheney model is true, P would be like 0.01, you know, 100 people, uh, 100 friends. So the real networks are usually sparse. So this dense case uh, we did um, just as a first step to understanding the thing. Um, now the problem is the main issue, so there is a deep you know, graph, the graph theoretic issue here, which is that the graph theoretic tools that we used for this analysis, Samaritan's lemma and the uh, uh, graph limit theory of Lovas and co-authors, they are useful only for the dense case, okay? And, uh, and this, for instance, you know, developing a satisfactory version of Samaritan's regularity lemma, so this is, you know, this is an open problem for uh, 40 years. So, and I'll tell you why that is. So, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you why, what's, what's the underlying reason why uh, this, this, is, uh, this is challenging. So, so the main issue is the following, uh, that the problem is to enumerate the number of graphs with a given set of properties. So for instance, you have to understand how many graphs are there with M edges and K vertices, okay? This, kind of, this is the kind of thing that you have to understand. Now, for dense graphs, this approximate counting is possible with Samaritan's lemma. So how is this? 
So I, I won't tell you, and I don't have time to tell you what this, this, thing, this lemma is, but what it does is the following. It classifies the set of all dense graphs on n vertices into a bounded number of types. And the number of types depends on the desired accuracy of approximation. So you want to approximately count something, and, and you want you know, approximation up to error epsilon. So depending on epsilon, you can classify the graphs into, into, into types, so it's, it's sort of a compactness thing. You can, uh, you can, the number of types will just depend on epsilon. And within each type, you can count using classical large deviation techniques. So that's, that's the combination of large deviations and similarity lemma that comes in. Uh, and the graph limit theory will allow you to take a limit uh, to infinity, so uh, to embed the whole thing into, um, um, into an infinite object. So the regularity lemma is inapplicable in the, in the sparse setting. We do not know how to classify sparse graphs into types. So I'll tell you a little bit more on how this means. So what this means, so for, in, for instance, an excess number of triangles uh, in a sparse graph can occur because there are extra edges that are distributed uniformly, or a small number of vertices that are highly interconnected, or a small number of vertices that are high connectivity to the rest, and these small things can happen in very tiny regions in sparse graphs. So in, in, in a dense graph, so very tiny regions don't matter, so you can just forget about them. But in sparse graphs, uh, even very tiny regions can give rise to uh, serious anomalies. And this classification, you know, what are the all possible structures of sparse graphs? Uh, this is not yet captured by anything, any tool that we have in graph theory. Okay, so we, we really don't understand this. Now, so we tried hard to get around this problem, and then, uh, you know, uh, so with Am Amit Dembo at Stanford, I, I have a paper uh, which is the same title as, a, as the title of this talk, Nonlinear Large Deviations, which goes beyond this uh, graph theoretic setting and, and, and bypasses the regularity lemma. So I, I look at it from this different viewpoint, uh, going beyond the graph theoretic setting. And, um, and using this, so I'll tell you one outcome of this, uh, of this new theory, um, is that uh, there is this um, more recent work of Lubezki and Zhao, where they show the following. You consider the Erdos-Schrony graph GNP, you look at the probability that the number of triangles exceeds the expected value by a fraction delta. Now, delta is fixed, but here n is going to infinity, but, and p, instead of remaining fixed, is going to zero, but okay, we cannot, we have, there's this barrier, so the theory is still incomplete. But uh, going to zero slower than this, then you have this explicit formula of the probability. It's like e to the minus n squared p squared log one over p times a constant, which is the minimum of these two things. And, uh, and, and then, you know, they, there is a follow-up paper, so I'll tell you about that. So, so this problem has opened for a very long time, this upper tail problem. Uh, so there is, a, there is a paper of Swanti Janssen called the infamous upper tail, this upper tail problem for uh, triangles. Um, so initially, they didn't even know what's the right, what are the right exponents on n and p. And then that was fixed. And then there was, uh, you know, this log factor was missing. And then, you know, I was one of the people who, who fixed that. And th there's a log factor. But this constant dependence on delta was, was completely open. And now, now this is known because of this work, uh, which uses this. And this, you know, this thing comes because of some limitations of this theory, of the nonlinear large deviation theory. Uh, and this has been generalized by uh, these four authors more recently. Uh, where they go beyond triangles, they go to other subgraph counts, and um, they can handle these uh, these objects. Okay. Okay. So here is uh, here is a summary. So the main problem is that we do not yet understand the nature of sparse graphs. Uh, the thing is, we understand some sparse graph structures, but not all possible structures in totality. So the similarity lemma um, gives you a classification of all possible structures that a dense graph can have. So somehow it gives a complete classification of that. Uh, you know, as a compactness theorem. So it, it tells you that it's a compact, essentially it's, a, it's, a, it's embeddable in a compact space and uh, you can identify the correct metric and so on. But we do not understand the sparse graphs. We, we don't know how to embed sparse graphs in a compact space and, and you know, understand the structure uh, by, by that method. Uh, the problem can be solved by, uh, by uh, you know, if somebody can prove a, a suitable version of, some, of the regularity lemma for sparse graphs, but you know, this would have many consequences, including various famous things uh, of recent times, um, uh, such as the Green Tau theorem. That, uh, but you know, this, uh, there is no hope for a solution, as far as I know. Um, so, so instead, what we did is uh, 
you know, circumvented the problem uh, using this, uh, these tools of nonlinear large deviations, which unfortunately I don't have the time to tell you um, what the main results are and what the uh, things are. But, but anyway, it, they, they already have some, several breakthroughs. And um, um, the theory is still uh, not complete. You saw, saw that n to the minus 1 over 42, and uh, you know, that should go to n to the minus 1 half. Uh, so that needs improvement. And from the applied perspective, there's a gap between networks that apply, appear in the real world versus networks whose large deviation properties can be theoretically analyzed. So, so there are many, many networks that appear in, uh, in the real world, and you would want to understand what happens if something rare. So the main problem with rare events, rare event analysis is that there, it's hard to just do a simulation. And OK, you don't need to do math. You just do a simulation. OK, you can wait forever. You know, simulation will never converge. Um, so, so you cannot do a, a rare event analysis using simulations. You need to do the math. And we don't know how to do that. So that's a problem that needs to be bridged. OK, thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for some questions, if people would like to ask. Yes, yes. Does this apply to Facebook, where everybody has 3,000 friends? Um, uh, I'll get out of your way. Yeah, oh, well. <laughs> No, no, it doesn't. So Facebook, you know, the for, first of all, the structure of Facebook, uh, it's hard to do mathematical modeling, is mainly because the data is not available. You know, they, they wouldn't give us the data. So, so we, you know, and I don't see any chance of that. So, so we... I don't know what's, what's their interest, you know, they... Uh, you know they have their they have their own people who are trying to increase revenue, so that's uh, that's mainly mainly what. Yeah. Are there examples that we're familiar with of bed scraps in real life? So, so yeah, I'll repeat the question for the mic, if nothing okay. else. Yes. Oh, sorry. Are, are there examples of dense graphs in real life that we might be familiar with? Um, not so much. So, uh, you know, for instance, if you consider uh, very small uh, networks, like there is this um, example of um, a network of students at Caltech, which are like 700 uh, some, you know, some students. And, and uh, in that, it's not dense, but let's say if you consider all people who are friends of friends. Okay, so then that it's an artificial example of a dense network. So people have some artificial examples of that. I've heard some other examples which come up um, in, uh, from biology and so on, but not, not so much. So real world graphs are almost always sparse. Question there. There's a microphone. Um, if one writes down Samaradi's theorem in a quantitative way, the quantitative bounds are notoriously kind of weak. Does that have any shadow, any effect on your theory? So the thing is, that was the main reason why we needed to develop this new theory, because the quantitative bounds will let you let p go to infinity only as, uh, well, you can use a weak, weak regularity lemma. And even if you use a weak regularity lemma, the, the um, p can go to zero only like some negative power of log n. Uh, and that's too slow. So we wanted to break that barrier and get to n to the minus something. And you know, that's why we had to develop this, this new theory. And the graph theorists uh, think that uh, you know, this, this theory may have some bearing on, um, on how to break the barriers that cannot be, cannot be broken by Samaritan's lemma, but you know, we aren't sure about that. So, you know, so, but but the, if you just use the quantitative regularity lemma, it won't give you anything uh, like n to the minus some negative power of n. You won't get that. All right. Thank you very much. That was a lovely presentation. <laughs>